All right, so I've begun the recording. We'll start with the previous chapters. So chapter one of Mark, it begins with the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, he quotes a little from Exodus, a little from some other places, and most of it from Isaiah. So, verse 3, the voice of one shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Again, if we go back to Isaiah, specifically Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, we see that these passages are about Yahweh God. And yet here they are being applied to Jesus. This is one of the first indications of deity here, that Jesus is in fact God. So, we have John the Baptist, he's running around and he is proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins yet he is preparing the way for jesus number one he's baptizing people but jesus will come and baptize them with the holy spirit so another way that he is kind of laying out the path is we'll learn in mark chapter 6 that he actually is martyred for his faith and adherence to the law and the scriptures. So that's another way where he just kind of lays out the path, proclaims the baptism, and then he also dies before Jesus dies as well. After that, Jesus is baptized. We see the three persons of the Trinity. He is then being tempted, and then he is ministering in Galilee. He calls some of his disciples, about four of them at first. He heals a man with an unclean spirit heals some more people, and does some preaching, and finally he cleanses a leper at the end of chapter 1. Then we move on to chapter 2, where a paralytic is healed. This is one of the other notifications of deity. Jesus says, child, your sins are forgiven. And then verse 7, why does this man speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who is able to forgive sins except God alone? We looked at a number of verses in the Old Testament that shows that the scribes here are actually right. So either Jesus is blaspheming or he is God. Wonderful little dichotomy there that we see. After that, he calls Levi, also known as Matthew, the tax collector. And then he runs into some disputes with the Pharisees about fasting. Jesus replies to them that the bridegroom the bridegroom's attendants can't fast when the bridegroom is with them, but they will fast eventually. And then about plucking grain on the Sabbath, they have another contention with Jesus, but he tells them that he is Lord of the Sabbath. And then in chapter 3, we have another dispute with the Pharisees. They were saying that he can't heal anyone on the Sabbath, and yet Jesus has already said that he is Lord of the Sabbath, and the goal of the Sabbath is not to let people die or let people, you know, not be helped or anything like that. You can help people on the Sabbath, apparently, especially if you're the Lord of the Sabbath. So he does that. He heals the man with the withered hand. Then he heals some more people. And in verses 13 to 19, there we have the selection of the 12 apostles. So this is the list where we have all the 12 and again, I would recommend that you memorize this list if you haven't already, just to know the 12 apostles. Really good information to have. Verses 20 and onwards, we have a couple more disputes, especially with the scribes here. And basically, they're saying that the Holy Spirit is an unclean spirit, and that Jesus is using power from demons and the prince of demons and they have either blasphemed against the holy spirit or they are coming dangerously close enough so that jesus would warn them about that so some good things to note here about blaspheming against the whole holy spirit it is the unforgivable sin but we see not christians in danger of this or doing it we see rather non-christian scribes doing this who equate good with evil and say that the unclean spirit, or so they, they say that the Holy Spirit that Jesus has is actually an unclean spirit. So pretty bad stuff. And we finally move on to Jesus asking, who is my mother or my brothers? 
He looked around and said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, whoever does the will of God, this person is my brother and sister and mother, in other words, family. Chapter 4, we have the parable of the sower. We looked at a couple different options for interpreting that. And basically, at least my conclusion was, is that the first three, you know, the rocky ground, the path, the weeds choking it, those were not believers. But the last one, and we looked at the Greek a little bit too, which denoted a, you know, an inward understanding and really understanding the word. It just comes in one ear, doesn't go out the other ear like the other three do. And they also bear fruit, which is extremely important for that. So that was pretty much chapter four. We have a couple other parables, some about the a lamp, about the seed that grows by itself, specifically about the kingdom of God, and also the mustard seed that grows a lot. Verses 35 and onward of chapter 4, the calming of the storm, we're going to see a parallel to this in chapter 6. So, there's this storm, Jesus rebukes the wind, be quiet, be silent, and they are terrified after that, perhaps even more so than the storm that was about to kill them all. Who then is this? that even the wind and sea obey him. Chapter 5, demon-possessed man is healed. They throws those demons into the swine herd and they kill themselves. And the people really didn't like that, so they kind of asked him to leave the region. After that, we have Jairus and his daughter, along with a woman with the blood problem, and they've been healed. And that is pretty much chapter 5 there. So let's move on, finally to chapter 6. This is the one that we're looking at and we have a number of different pericopes here to look at and if you're new here a pericope is basically a short little section that can kind of stand on its own. So whenever you see that little bolded title that isn't a verse but it's kind of describing what's going on that's what a pericope is wherever someone decides to you know put that section. So that's chapter 6, and let's see, can we have a volunteer to read verses 1 to 6? Let's just go with that first real short section. Only six verses. Well, all right, I will. That would be great. Verse six, huh? All right. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things, they said? What is this wisdom given to him, and how are these miracles performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, is what is in this version, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Then Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his household. So he was not able to do any miracles there except that he laid his hand on a few six people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. And that was the Holman Christian standard for those that wonder. Yeah, great. So that's the first six verses. We see that they have been too familiar with Jesus. Isn't this Jesus, son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and so on, the carpenter? And we saw a parallel back in chapter 3, and I think I mentioned it in our chapter 3 study, that there would be another instance like that where people were exposed to Jesus' miracles and yet they still lacked belief. So any thoughts on that? Or we can just move on because we got a long chapter to get through. Yeah, Kurt brings up a good point there. 
wish we had time to go through all four Gospels at the same time, but it is nice to have these little things there because they all complement each other. So the thing Jesus taught them about was about how he f was the fulfillment of a prophecy about the Messiah. And, you know, they knew him as a kid, as a little carpenter boy, and they knew his family and things like that. How could this guy be the Messiah? I grew up with him, basically. I knew this guy as a little kid. So, yeah, it goes back to the, basically, the little idiom that he says where a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. So it's a double negative there which says that a prophet is without honor in his hometown basically. And there's another kind of more recent expression that we use today. At least some people, if you're old enough, it's let me see, it's familiarity breeds contempt, basically that expression. You might have heard it before. Basically the same idea here. They were too familiar with him. All right, so let's move on then to the next sections. Let's see if someone could read verse, either depending on where your verse is cut off at, just the next pericope there, verse 6 or 7. But let's say verse 6 to... 29. So this is a big section here. I guess I'll do it birthday girl whenever you're ready um real quick nick where did yours cut off at because <laughs> i don't know where mine would start you could just start at verse six even if it goes back verse to the six. previous okay i'm reading out of the esv um and he marveled because of their unbelief and he went about the villages he went about among the villages teaching and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed them, anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had been known, had become known. Some said John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. That is why the miraculous powers are at work in him. Uh, I'm sorry, my cat's making noise. Um, can I be right back? I just cut off at 15. Yeah, that's fine. Take your time. Okay, thanks. Sorry. All right, just to recap while she's doing that then. So he is sending out the 12. They're going two by two in little groups of two and they are not taking much with them so that they can rely on God. And they're kind of going around preaching to people and they're also expelling demons, healing people, things like that. All right, you can go whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Sorry, one second. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John, and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him, and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, 
knowing that he was a righteous and holy man whom he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. But when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his gusts, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. All right, so after he sends them out two by two, we kind of summarized that already, then we have Herod killing John the Baptist and that whole story there. Herod himself, let's see, verse 17, had sent and arrested John and bound him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of Philip, his brother, because he had married her. So they were doing something unlawful there. And John was speaking out against that, but Herod didn't really want to kill him because he was a righteous man and he kind of liked John. So he made this compromise where he just arrested John instead of fully killing him like Herodias wanted. So yeah, let's look at the text a little bit there. So 6.11, it's basically the, the extra part there about what Kurt brought up, assuredly I tell you it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That I would say, and you can disagree with me of course, I would say that's an addition that you will have in your KJV and KJV translations that are all based on the later manuscripts. So the earlier manuscripts the earliest ones that we have do not have that section. It seems to me that it was added from Mark chapter 11. We don't know how exactly it got there, but, you know, I guess they saw Mark chapter 11, or I think it was Mark chapter 11, some other place in Mark where that line was in there. And they maybe thought that it would be nice to have that line also in Mark chapter 6. Either way, the earliest manuscripts don't include that half of the verse or that little section. Just some interesting stuff. Just the difference between the later manuscript tradition and the earlier manuscript tradition. So you won't see that in the ESV, I don't think. That Sodom and Gomorrah line. And I'm checking just to make sure. Nope, you don't see that. But you will see it in the KJV and KGV. All right. So you can ask questions on that if you want on 611, but I'm going to try to keep moving on to the other questions. So DB asks on verse 20, when it says he kept him safe, is Herod keeping John safe or is John keeping Herod safe? That's a interesting question. I think it's, yeah, I think it's Herod keeping John safe because the goal of Herodias is to kill him. All right, so yeah, that's pretty much it, two by two. And then it might seem that Mark is kind of randomly throwing in the death of John the Baptist here, but he has a very, very intentional point that he's making. So if we look at verse 30 real quick, this is after John the Baptist, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So what's going on here? Well, we see Jesus sending them out two by two, and he's telling them to do all these things. And then we see John the Baptist, and then we jump back 
to where the apostles have finished what Jesus told them to do, and they're now returning to him and telling him about what they had done and taught. So here we have a classic Markin sandwich. So first, disciples, middle part, John the Baptist, and finally, the bottom slice of the sandwich, we have the disciples again. And Mark usually has a very important theme that he's trying to do, an important point that he is trying to convey to us by intersplicing these stories. And it seems to me that the point that he's making is about the cost of discipleship. So we got the disciples running around here. Then we have John the Baptist, and he is martyred. So... There's a cost to discipleship is what I think Mark is trying to get at. And even in the first story, there's a cost there. They're only able to take a few little things with them. A staff, no bread, no bag, and no money in their belts at all. So that's another cost. They'll have to live kind of harshly as they run around and they'll have to depend on God specifically and explicitly as to the best of their abilities there. So there is a cost involved. And I guess it's also worth noting that what they were told to bring and not bring goes back to Exodus and basically what the Jews there were told not to bring and to bring so that they could go out and depend on God and pretty much go out and leave real quick. I think it was Exodus 12. Let me see if that's correct. Yeah, Exodus 12, verse 11, In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. And after that, of course, they fled from Egypt. Yeah, and B brings up another good point there. Another consequence of discipleship is rejection. So it was assumed that they would be rejected at some place, and then they were just called to, you know, dust off their feet as a testimony against them and John the Baptist of course was rejected quite strongly so yeah chaotic up brings up a real good point there what do you guys think it means shake off the dust on your feet as a symbol against them Yeah, we got some good answers there. Obviously, it is something bad against them, so you're all going in the right direction there. And I'll just read off from the commentary here. This is a searing indictment since Jews traveling outside Palestine were required to shake themselves free of dust when returning home, lest they pollute the Holy Land. So they're not going around, I don't think, mostly at least, in Gentile territory here and yet they are acting like they are because the Jews here and the people here are rejecting their message so it is pretty insulting to them yeah DB brings up a good point there so how do we apply this does it mean if we try to evangelize someone and they decline, we should just seize all contact with them and also shake the dust off our feet? How do we apply this, if at all?
Yeah, Nick and B are bringing up some good differences that we should keep in mind. Yeah, and Sound brings up a good point there that I think goes in the right direction of where I want to kind of take this. One thing that is, you know, it's a time-sensitive matter. One, you could easily get killed. And number two, we don't have all the time to be witnessing to people. They're the disciples of Jesus, and Jesus is going around. He's got, you know, bigger fr fish to fry, so to speak, with his atonement and crucifixion and everything like that. So... I would say that we should be very careful of applying this to us, either the going by two by two, you know, not taking bread with you, but taking a staff, your travelers, without your traveler's bag, and without taking any money in your belts. And the main reason why I think this is specific is, well, other than the reasons that sound gave and the one I added on, the main reason is that they are reporting back to Jesus here. So verse 30, the disciples regathered to Jesus and reported to him everything that they had done and that they had taught, and then they go back to directly following Jesus there. So this is a very specific thing meant for the disciples and not meant for us. So when you go around witnessing, please take money with you and take your traveler's bag if you have the, I don't know what the equivalent of that would be, whatever. And you don't have to bring a staff when you go out evangelizing. And that also applies to shaking the dust off your feet and, you know, not talking with those people anymore. The disciples had things to do. If you have a friend who initially rejects the gospel, I would say basically what Horse said, keep the door open. You know, you can keep talking to them. You can be persistent there. You don't have to run away from that, shake the dust off your feet and report back to Jesus and then follow him physically. You don't have to do that. That was for the disciples there specifically. All right, so we see the sandwich there. Again, disciples sent out, Herod kills John the Baptist, and then we see the disciples coming back and reporting to Jesus what they had done. All right, let's move on then. Let's say verses 30 to 44. Any volunteers? I'll go again, but I don't want to steal anyone else's fun. I'm not sure anyone else is volunteering, so go ahead. 30 to 44. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages, and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five, and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the grass. So they sat down in groups, by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing, and broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. 
and they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Perfect. So that's the feeding of the five thousand. There's also a very similar miracle that happens a little later in Mark, which is the feeding of the four thousand. So any thoughts on that section there? It's uh, probably one of the more popular stories we hear from the Gospels. Yeah, we could see some parallels between this provision and the manna that fell from heaven for the Israelites as they ran around in the wilderness. Using the power of math, <laughs> that's, that's one way to put it. Yeah, and that's a really good point that sound brings up. Jesus tested their faith when he said, you give them something to eat, and they, you know, started freaking out, and, you know, how, how are we going to get all this food for these people? And it's almost like they're kind of being sarcastic, perhaps, especially if they didn't have... 200 denarii, which was about, that's about seven months of wages for the average worker. So seven months is quite a bit to be carrying around. So it sounds like they were kind of making a sarcastic question there. Should we go and purchase bread for 200 denarii and give it to them to eat? And then Jesus, you know, go look, get some get whatever food you can, they come back with this really meager amount. So yeah, it was definitely what I think to be a test of faith. And in, in the other Gospels, they expound on this a little more with how, you know, how much the disciples were freaking out. Yeah, B brings up a really good point there too. The apostles immediately turn to worldly explanations even after they have seen all these different miracles that Jesus had already performed in, right in front of them. Yeah, so I think we got some good answers going around and some interesting questions on, you know, what exactly happened, things like that. So you guys can, of course, keep typing there if you want, but let's move on to the next section and we can just finish it off here. So any volunteers to read verses 45 to 56? Okay, go. Yeah, that would be great. Okie dokie, I am reading from New Century Version. Um, immediately, Jesus told his followers to get into the boat and go ahead, of the, uh, go ahead of him to Bethsaida, across the lake. He stayed there to send the people home. After sending them away, he went into the hills to pray. That night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on the land. And he saw his followers struggling hard to row out the boat because the wind was blowing against them. Between three and six o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the water. He wanted to walk past the boat. But when they saw him walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost and cried out. They all saw him and were afraid. But Jesus quickly spoke to them and said, Have courage, it is I. 
do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind became calm. The, follower, the, the followers were greatly amazed. They did not understand about the miracle of the five loaves because their minds were closed. When they had crossed the lake, they came to the shore of Genesaret and tied the boat there. When they got out of the boat, people immediately recognized Jesus. They ran everywhere in that area and began to bring sick people on mats wherever they heard he was, and everywhere he was, went, into towns, cities, or countryside, the people brought the sick to the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch just the edge of his coat, and all who touched it were healed. Good job. So that's the last couple sections there. We have a similarity to the storm back in the previous chapters, and, you know, we have... A little bit of a storm, at least it was pretty hard for them to be rowing, and the wind was against them. And Jesus is walking on the water towards them. One real quick thing that I want to note here is that in the Old Testament, we have this fairly consistent theme. And well, it's more than fairly consistent, but it's in the Old Testament, only God can walk on water. So we have Job 9.8. He is the one who alone stretches out the heavens and who tramples on the waves of the sea. 38.16 Have you entered into the sea's sources, or have you walked around in the recesses of the deep? And this is God talking to Job there, asking Job, you know, have you done any of these things? If so, if you haven't, then, you know, why are you so arrogant? Psalm 7.19 7, your way was through the sea, and your path through many waters, yet your footprints were not discerned, and, and so on. We have a couple other verses there about that. But the point is that in the Old Testament, only God walks on water here. And this would be quite astounding to his disciples who are probably really familiar with the Old Testament, and yet they are seeing Jesus again and again doing things that only God does. So, real interesting stuff. And yeah, horse brings up a good point there. Moses and Elijah also had to part the waters to cross, not just walking across. So they parted it, and, you know, of course we see specific references in there that God is the one, of course, who's parting it. Moses isn't doing that by his own power. But we do see Jesus doing things by his own power, and he's also even delegating that authority to others. That's something we don't see very often either. He delegates that authority, especially when he sent out the disciples two by two. He gave them authority to cast out demons and heal people and all that good stuff. And, you know, they didn't understand the loaves. They didn't understand this. They thought he was a ghost. They were extraordinarily astounded. After that, they, they landed and healed a lot more people. So, any other thoughts? I know you guys are typing there, that's good. Yeah, B brings up a good point there. So, at the end of verse 48, wonder why Jesus meant what he meant by pass by them. And it's definitely an interesting question. It it's most likely that he didn't actually mean to pass pass by them and kind of ignore them and keep going but we see some similarities in language where kind of I guess Moses when he was about to see the back of God and God would kind of shield him from the full measure of glory God said that he would pass by Moses over there. In other words, he was just going to show Moses some of his glory. So maybe that's what Jesus meant here when he says, pass by, just to kind of show them and demonstrate to them that he can do these miraculous things. And yet they still didn't really understand. <laughs> but their hearts were hardened, as the end of verse 52 says. And yeah, Nick brings up some good points. We see the selfishness of these disciples. It was all about them. 
You know, get rid of this crowd, calm this storm. Aren't you concerned that we're going to perish here? As the calming of the storm story goes. Aren't you concerned that we're going to all die here? So yeah, real good points there. I think that pretty much wraps it up. But any final thoughts that you guys just had in the back of your head on anything that we covered in Chapter 6? Before we close it out. Oh yeah, that's a good point. I guess I missed that question. What do you guys think? What does it mean that their hearts were hardened? Yeah, I think that's a good point there. Less likely to use faith as a starting point for what happened. <clears throat> yeah, minds were closed is a pretty good similar phrase, I think. So yeah, another couple references where they see this hardness of hearts in Mark. It's chapter 3, verse 5, looking around them with anger grieved at the hardness of their hearts. This was the Pharisees who contested him about, you know, healing the man with the withered hand, and they had hardened hearts. And we see that in a couple other places as well, and implicitly, too. So I think it simply means that they did not come to a faithful conclusion about the events. So same with his hometown. They didn't have faith, really. And he didn't do any miracles there because they didn't have faith and they did not have an appropriate response. So it doesn't go that, okay, you see this miracle, okay, I see this miracle, I see that it's real, okay, now I'm going to put faith in, in Jesus or whatever. It doesn't work like that. It's very easy to fall into a hardness of heart. So it goes back to our theme in Mark and in the modern days where people say, well, if I just had a miracle, if Jesus, you know, just appeared in front of me and did something miraculously, then I would believe in him. Then I would trust in him. Well, that doesn't necessarily follow if you see a miracle. Yep, that's another good point by Kurt. Said that if someone won't believe, they won't believe, even if someone comes back from the dead. I'm not sure if that was, it might have been Jesus, but the place I'm thinking of for that is Luke chapter 16 with the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And I think it was Abraham speaking there. Let me just make sure. Maybe you had a different passage in mind though. But it is good just to kind of bring it up. Though, of course, Jesus was the one saying the parable. Yeah. Yeah, you typed that before I said that. Yeah, let me just kind of put that verse down there. Luke 16, 31, just because it's a really good verse. But he told him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Yep, another good question there. They saw all these healings, you know, was Jesus the Christ, the Messiah? Was he the Son of God, even more than both of those things? Or, you know, was he just a guy healing people and my arm hurts, so I'd like to get that healed? Definitely good questions about motives, intentions, and faith. But I think that pretty much sums up Mark chapter 6. Does anyone want to volunteer to close us out with a word of prayer?
Do it. That would be great. Holy Father, we come to you again at the end of a great Bible study. And I pray that your name was praised and blessed with the uh, illumination at the studying of your word. We pray that you will be glorified today and through all of our days and that you will uh, teach us your word and that you will teach us your path. Uh, we pray that every one of the people here in this Bible study and in the server who couldn't make it, and uh, that they are doing okay and that you will take care of them. In your name, amen. Amen. If you guys have any feedback 